AC and RC circuits. RC circuits, I guess you could say, are a special case of AC circuits, although AC, never mind, there's all kinds of semantics I could go into that I don't care about. Fine, an AC voltage source is advertised to give 25 volts AC at 20 hertz. Okay, and let's assume that this is not false advertising, that that's what it really does. So A, what is the amplitude, period, frequency, and angular frequency of the voltage signal? All right, so first of all, remember 25 volts AC, when an AC power supply advertises that, that is actually the RMS. So VRMS, we know for the power supply, is 25 volts. That's what 25 volts AC means, right? And Whereas really, if our power supply here, which we're going to hook up to things, is a V of T, if you plot V of T, it's going to oscillate between plus and minus the amplitude, which I will call V sub zero as the amplitude here. And remember that the RMS voltage, which is what called the AC voltage, is a little bit lower. For a sine wave, which is if it's an, a, if it's an AC power supply, it's probably got a, a, a functional form or a signal that's very close to a sine wave. So for a sine wave, VRMS is equal to V naught divided by the square root of two. So that tells us that V naught, which is the amplitude, is just going to be root two times VRMS. All right, and so now we can do that, and I'll do all of these on my calculator at the very end. So it's going to be root 2 times 25, not 25 hertz, root 2 times 25 volts. All right, so that's the amplitude. We've got that. What else do we need? Uh, we need the frequency. That's pretty easy. Frequency, 20 hertz. We already have that. We also need the angular frequency. So remember, frequency is hertz, means cycles per second. That's what hertz is. Whereas angular frequency is in radians per second. And there are two pi radians in one cycle. So that means in, when it goes through one cycle, I'm thinking about like a circle, but really it's the sine wave down or I did a cosine, right, down and up once. It'll have gone through two pi radians. So if it goes through more radians than cycles, you'd expect omega to be bigger. So it's going to be two pi times 20 hertz. And I'll put those all in my calculator later. So that's going to be the angular frequency. And um, what I'm going to go ahead is say, we know it's going to be 2 pi times 20. With angular frequency, we, you, we usually write it as seconds to the minus 1. Really, it's radians per second. And you can think of this as a unit conversion, 2 pi radians per cycle. And the cycle canceled the cycle in the numerator of cycles per second. And we're left as radians per second. But cycles is just a number. And radians is sort of a non-unit. So I'm going to write it like this. And what else do we need? Oh, we need the uh, period. Well, period, that's easy. I can do this one in my head. Period is 1 over f. So that's going to be 1 20th of a hertz. And hertz being cycles per second, 1 over 1 over seconds is just seconds. And 1 20th is 0 0.05 seconds. So we know here, I had plotted V versus time, that the period is 0 0.05 seconds. All right, so that's part A. And I'll go ahead and stick those in my calculator. I'll archive the results over here in case I need them again. So the uh, uh, amplitude, V0, came out to be 35.355. Too, too many sig figs. Uh, the frequency, of course, is 20 hertz. The angular frequency came out to be 125.66, 125.66 seconds to the minus 1. And the period, of course, was 0 0.05, 1 20th of a second. So to the right number of sig figs, this is 35 volts, right? We have two sig figs here. Let's assume that's two in that as well. And this would be, well, OK. I'm going to call it 126, um, even though really I should call it 130 because there's only two sig figs. But whatever, close enough. Good. All right, that's part A. Then in part B, if the voltage source is connected across a resistor with resistance 270 ohms. So now we have our voltage source and a resistor R, where R is equal to 270 ohms. What is the maximum instantaneous power dissipated in the circuit, the minimum instantaneous power, and the average power dissipated in the circuit? 
Well, remembering that power is equal to IV. So that's the power dissipated through a... And when we say power dissipated in the circuit, well, you're not dissipating, you're putting it in here. The only thing dissipating it is the resistor. So that's the same as power dissipated in the resistor. Power is IV, but we also know that for a resistor, V equals IR. Resistors have a very fast time response, so that'll be true at all times. So I can substitute for I, I'm going to substitute V over R. So power is V squared over R. I don't even have to worry about current. So the max instantaneous power is going to be V0 squared over R, right? Because that's the maximum voltage you can get. So that's going to be 35.355 volts squared over 270 ohms. Let's think about the units for a moment. So remember, volt is a joule per coulomb, and, and we've got those squared. And then an ohm, well, from looking at this, an ohm is a volt per amp, and a volt per amp, so a volt is a joule per coulomb, and a amp is a coulomb per second, so we end up with this. So the coulomb squared cancels coulomb squared, joules cancels one of those, we have joules per second. The units will be watts, which is correct. So I can put that in my calculator, and I will. The minimum power dissipated, instantaneous power, is zero. Because when the voltage is zero, there's no power being dissipated. So it's instantaneous. And you think, wait, I've plugged AC light bulbs into AC sources and they're never off. Well, they aren't. But the um, power being put into the resistor, heating up the resistor, 60 times a second goes to zero. It's just the resistor the, the um, filament doesn't cool off fast enough that it's a pretty steady glow at that point. Okay, so the minimum power, and then the um, average power, or the overall power, which is the same as the average power. That is, if I run this circuit for five minutes, how much energy divided by five minutes? How much energy gets used up in the resistor divided by five minutes? That's the overall power, the average power over a long time of course, is going to be the RMS, which is VAC squared over R. And that is going to be 525 volts squared, because that's 25 squared, I hope, divided by 270 ohms. So I expect that to be about two-ish, um, just looking at it. So good, I can put these numbers in my calculator. Haha, uh -huh, I was wrong, 25 squared is 625. I knew that. Okay, so, the overall power is 625 volts squared. 625 divided by 270 is um, 2.3. I was right, it was pretty close to 2. 2.3 watts. The max power, so this is the average power being dissipated. The max power is equal to, are you ready for this? 4.6 watts. And you might at this point think, hey, wait a minute, 4.6 is 2 times 2.3. And sure enough, it is. And the reason is, is that this V is root 2 times, um, well, this V, right? So V0, we, we did that. It was done before. V0 is root 2 times VAC. So when I square it, it becomes 2. The rest of everything is the same. So yeah, this is going to be twice that. So that's part B. Part C, plot all of the following. Oh, I've already started it. The voltage across the resistor is a function of time. Done. Uh, the current through the resistor is a function of time, and the power dissipated is a function of time. B as quantitative as possible. I'm going to draw a whole new plot just for space reasons. Okay, so here's T. Um, here I'm going to have, so I'm going to plot in red the voltage as a function of time. So this here's 35.4. That's the uh, resistor as a function of time, and I'm going to plot it through two cycles. So when I say be as quantitative as possible, what that means is I can say that, oh, this is 0 0.5 seconds. And, sorry, 0 0.05 seconds. And this is 0 0.1 seconds. See, right? You can be quantitative. Um, I'll dash this out to indicate those things go to there. And in fact, let's be quantitative here to indicate that this is minus 35.4 volts. All right, so that's V of T as a function of time. Then, I also need to plot the current as a function of time. So here's I of T. Well, we know that the current is going to, I'm, I'm supposed to draw it just right on top of this red. And so I'll do my best, and then you can still see the red and the green, because the current goes exactly with the voltage. Now then, what is I max? I max is 
2.355 volts divided by 270 ohms. So I max is, and yeah, actually probably if I had been smart, I wouldn't have lined them up because of course I doesn't come in volts. So there's no reason why they need to be lined up, but I did. So that was probably a mistake, but 0.13 amps. So this scale here is 0.13 amps, and that is 0.13 amps. And then finally, power dissipated. Well, you multiply these two curves by each other. So what are you gonna get? Well, it's gonna be this, right? Because um, when both of these are zero, the power is zero, but when both of these are high, the power is highest. And now I know that this scale, I had it over here, is 4.6 watts. 4.6 watts. So this is the power. So red is voltage, I is current, blue is power. And that's that plot, and that's the first problem. Ta-da! Assume that a light bulb has a resistance of 100 ohms. We know from lab that light bulbs are not ohmic, right? So remember, you made this plot in lab where you plotted the current as a function of the voltage. Actually, I think, I forget which one I told you to do. I think you actually did voltage as a function of current. And it looked something like that, if I remember correctly. Or it might have been that. I don't remember which one it is. But uh, the point is, is that it's not a straight line, which it would be if it were an ohmic resistor. But now we're going to go ahead and pretend that they are ohmic by saying, um, you know, if, if the voltage as a function of current looks like this, if at this point, we take the resistor, who would have the same V and I at, say, this voltage. We'll call that I sub zero. Why not? And this V sub zero. Whatever the resistor of that resi resistance of that resistor is, we're going to pretend the light bulb has that resistance. It only works exactly at this voltage, but it's not too far off if you don't go too far away. So we're going to do that just for purposes of being able to do a calculation. And you'll see when I ask, it's actually not that big a deal. When you turn off the light bulb, you want, to, want it to look like it takes a few seconds for it to fade out rather than for it to switch off immediately. And you know from lab, when you turn it off, it's like, boom. It's not absolutely immediate, but it's really freaking fast. What could you do to accomplish this? All right, so you have a circuit here. You have a switch which starts closed. Um, and you have your light bulb, right? So what I'm going to do is cheat a little bit and draw a resistor with a circle around it so it's a symbol halfway between a resistor symbol and a light bulb symbol. And this thing is 100 ohms. When you open the switch, you want the resistor to take a few seconds to fade out. So right now, when the switch is closed, um, current is flowing through it. And because current is flowing through it, the thing glows. When you open it, no more current is flowing through it. Therefore, it stops glowing. So we want to still have current flowing through it. Well, we know. All right, first of all, we can use the coarse timing theorem, which says that, hey, we are talking about AC circuits and RC circuits, so therefore it's going to be one of these two things that I put in the circuit. And that's all well and good until you get to the final and you don't happen to know which thing we're talking about, but okay, fine. So it's going to be one of these two things. So you could use that theorem, but let's think about another thing. What do we know slowly decays away current, or equivalently, the voltage across a resistor? Hey, that's an RC circuit. So you might think, oh, well, great. I'll stick a capacitor in the circuit. C, and that'll do it. Done. Circle, move on to the next problem. So let's make sure it really works. This is something you should always do. Let's make sure it really works. So when you turn it on and you leave it running for a long time, eventually this capacitor will get charged with positive on that plate and negative on that plate. Then when you open the switch, what happens? Well, there's a voltage drop across the capacitor which you would think would cause a voltage drop across the resistor, but it's an open circuit. No current can flow here, so no current's gonna flow through the light bulb, so the light bulb will just turn off because no current's flowing through it. And the capacitor will stay charged because there's no current to discharge it. So this didn't work. We have to do something else. So here's another thing you could do. You could add a capacitor in parallel, right? So now let's think about what happens. When I close the switch, very quickly, because there's no resistance here, so really, really quickly, this capacitor will charge up. And once this capacitor is charged up to V0, no current will flow through here. Right? This is at V0, this is at V0, this is at the same potential as this, there's no need to add more charge here. So the capacitor just kind of sits there and doesn't do anything, as long as the switch is closed. And while the switch is closed, current will run through the resistor, 
the light bulb, and it'll glow. Then when you open the switch, now what's going to happen is current will flow like this through the resistor. But because it's a resistor, it won't flow infinitely fast, and it'll take some time for the charge to come off this capacitor. Aha, this is what we want. And what we want is RC to be a few seconds. What is a few seconds? I don't know. Let's call it three. And this is why it doesn't matter that I'm pretending the light bulb is a resistor. Because if I have its resistance wrong by a factor of a few, it doesn't matter because I'm talking a few seconds. That could be one, that could be six, whatever. Let's say a few seconds is three seconds. That's the time constant we want. So RC is equal to tau. We know what the resistance is. We can put in a capacitor. C of tau minus R, which would be three seconds divided by 100 ohms. So we want it to be three seconds, and hey, that's pretty easy. Three over 100s. Um, we want to have 0 0.03 farad. So to answer the question is, what could you do? You could put a 0 0.03 farad capacitor in parallel with the light bulb. Then when you open the switch, um, yeah, these two are in parallel with each other. The light bulb will fade. And the third problem, a capacitor with capacitance C equals 10 megafarads. Mega yes! 10 millifarads. C, which is 10 millifarads. It's very important. The difference between milli and mega is a factor of a billion. So get it right. Millifarads are connected in series to a resistor with resistance R equals 100 ohms. Suppose the capacitor starts charged. So that tells me the VC at time zero equals zero. So I'm using functional notation here. This means VC as a function of time. Right? It's, it's irritating that this is also the same as what you would write for VC times T. So there's problems. Math notation is horrible. We have to cope. How long does it take for the capacitors to decrease to 1% of its starting voltage? So we did a little bit of this in class. We started with V of T. We know that it's going to look something like this, where um, it starts here, right at uh, V0, we'll call it, uh, Vc of 0. I said it starts charged. Look, I totally lied to you. Vc of 0 equals V0, which is greater than 0. So it starts charged. Um, so great. So V0 starts like that, and we know from class that when this is down to 0.37 V0, or e to the minus 1 v0, that's this time constant, which is rc. And remember, we, in class, we said at 2, 3, 4, 5, and at 5 rc, it was less than 1%. And so you might be tempted to just say, well, I'll figure out the time constant, and I'll do 5 rc. But that won't be good enough. We can actually do better than that here. Because what we know is that v of t, or we'll call it vc of t, is equal to v0 times e to the minus t over tau, where tau is rc. And what we want is what is the t such that this is v0 over 100, right? So when it's 1%, that means 1 100th of what it started. So what I can do is I can solve this for t. Really? Yes, I totally can. Divide both sides by v0, and I get e to the minus t over rc is equal to 0 0.01. What do I do next? I take a natural logarithm of both sides. You're like, oh no, we can do logarithms. It's fine. It's a very basic math thing. So it's equal to the natural log of, I'm going to replace the color that I had, 0.01. All right, why am I doing this? The reason I'm doing this, what the natural log is the opposite operation of the e to the x. They, they go together like arc sine and sine go together. So if I have the natural log of e to the x, is just equal to x. They just undo each other. And that's really convenient here because I will get rid of the e here. And so I'll end up with minus t over rc is equal to the natural log of 0.01. And that is something you can just stick into a calculator. So I know that t, therefore, is equal to minus rc times the natural log of 1 over 100, which is minus 100 ohms times uh, 10, well, 10 millifarads is 10 times 10 to the minus 3 is 0 0.01 farads. And hey, look at that, 100 times 0 0.01 is just um, 1, right? 
So the answer is t is equal to minus the natural log of 0.01 seconds. So let's go ahead and put that into a calculator. We get, ta-da, 4.6 seconds. Remember before we were saying, oh, it's going to be 5 because we learned in class that five time constants, it's less than 1%. Well, and four, it was still greater. So hey, this works together. We knew it should be between four and five. So 4.6 seconds is how long this thing should take to decay. We just figured it out by starting with this and knowing that if I have something, I wanted to solve this for t and t was inside the exponential, I could use the natural log to get it out. And then I know how to do natural logs. In the calculator, I find the button that says LN. Although there is this frightening thing that the program I used to do the calculation actually spells LN L-O-G, which when you just write it out, usually means log base 10, which is different from natural log. So, oh dear. So you have to be a little careful when you're using calculators and computer programs to make sure when they do log, what is that log base? It might be base E, which is what natural log is. Whatever, don't worry about that. Your calculator probably just says LN, so you're good. And notice the natural log of 0 0.01 was minus 4.6, but then I had a negative here that canceled that and it was in seconds. So that's an S, not a 5. So it's 4.6 seconds. That was problem 3. In the last problem, I ask you to tell me what the output signal would look like if you sent a square wave into both a high-pass and a low-pass filter. So, okay, first of all, what's a square wave? So this is our input voltage, V in, as a function of time. And so a square wave just looks like this. Right, so it's Vn just oscillates between V0 and minus V0, but it doesn't oscillate as a sine wave. It's just V0, then boom, all of a sudden it's minus V0. Boom, all of a sudden it's V0. Boom, all of a sudden it's minus V0. I sounded like John Madden there. Boom, if anyone remembers that. You guys are all too young. So um, this here is the period. We'll call capital T is going to be the period of our input signal, right, because it goes down. Oh, no, that's right. It goes down um, top. Bottom, boom, back to top. So this is, boom. So this is the period. I could also have done the period like this, and then, or if I start here, go do, 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 do. It's like a blocked off sine wave. Okay, and what we're gonna do is use a high pass and a low pass filter such that this period is well outside the cutoff of the filter. And so let's start with the low pass filter. That one's easier to think about in this case. And so what this really means is, so for the low pass filter, it looks like this. Now, when I drew this in class, so we'll call this V in, is the voltage difference between that and that. When I drew it in class, I had an AC source there. But now we're going to have this source instead of the AC source. But really, the filter is just, here's the input voltage. Hook whatever you want up to the input voltage. So I'm going to hook up the function generator that. So V in will be that. And this is V out, is the potential difference between there and there. So this would be like, if I suppose that, I hooked up the function generator. And see, it looks like a square wave function generator. And then here I'm going to hook up my voltmeter, although really it will be a computer that can measure voltage as a function of time. What will the output voltage look like? So let's think. <coughs> it's a low pass filter, um, which means low frequency can get through, but high frequencies can't. And you might say, well, okay. Um, and where's my cutoff going to be? Let's make the cutoff such that the, um, the frequency cutoff, or the time constant, really, of this RC circuit is a lot less than T, okay? Um, which means that um, low pass will pass low frequency, i.e. high T, Right, because as f goes down, one t is equal to one over f. So as f goes down, t goes up. And I say, oh, and um, I really wanted to do it like this. No, I'm sorry. I want to do it like this, right? And high t. What does high t means? It means t bigger than tau. And sure enough, we have t bigger than tau. And so you might think, oh, so therefore it's just going to look exactly the same because the frequency here is, um, or really the period, the frequency is one over f. And that's a lot less than 1 over tau, right? So I can say that 1 over tau here, or the cutoff frequency, is a lot greater than 1 over f. And so, um, sorry, 1 over t, 
which is the frequency. So the frequency is a lot less than the cutoff frequency. This is a low pass filter, low frequencies get through. The output will look exactly like the input. That is not quite right because it's a low pass for sine wave frequencies. This is not a sine wave. So what you really have to do, well, there's a few ways you could do this. One is you could go full Fourier analysis and think about what sine waves would I have to add up to make this blocky square wave? And then you do a Fourier decomposition and you think, oh my goodness, what is this word Fourier he just used? Well, look it up. It's a, it's a good thing, but it's higher order math than what we've done in this class. So let's do a different thing. So instead of thinking about Fourier analysis, let's just think about the physics of the circuit. So what I'm going to do is do another plot. Where my brown fruit is? I'm going to do another plot here of voltage versus time. I'm going to plot the input voltage to start with, just again, so we have it for reference. Drawing it bigger this time. Okay, that's the input voltage. Let us assume that the capacitor starts uncharged. All right, so this is Vn, and then I'm going to plot V out in red. The capacitor starts uncharged. So initially, for the first however long this time is, this is actually just like a DC voltage source, right? For this time, it's just Vn. So there's Vn, the capacitor is uncharged, so there's no voltage drop from here to here. So current's going to flow like this. So current goes through the resistor, there'll be a voltage drop across the resistor. It'll start building up on the capacitor, and actually we know what this looks like. Current's going to build up, you know, this is one of these things. It's the voltage versus time, and it's going to build up towards the asymptote. And then this here is the, is the tau. Well, here's the thing is the tau is a lot less than t. It's a lot less than this time. So it should build up like this. So it should look something like that, right? But because the tau is very small here, it's a lot less than t, it should actually kind of catch up eventually. So it should look like this. And then now all of a sudden it has to get all the way down to here. Right, it has this voltage difference, not just to zero, but all the way down to that. So that's going to depend on the tau. So it should go down something like that. Boom. And then it should curl up something like that. Doom. Catch up. It should go down to something like that. Curl up. Right, so that's what the output should look like. It looks sort of like the input. It's pretty close to the input. In fact, if this time constant is small enough, it looks really close to the input. But there is a little bit of a lag for it to catch up, kind of. Right, really, there shouldn't be a hard corner here. It should just be a smooth curve all the way up. So if the time constant is small enough, yeah, the output will look just like the input, but it's not exactly the same. The output really is um, the output really is sort of slowly or is is lagging the input a little bit. And when the input changes, the output has to the capacitor has to catch up a little bit. So you'll get this sort of rounded off corners like this. These corners should remain pretty sharp but then these corners will remain rounded up. So what we're going to do is try that in lab and see how it goes. So that's what it looks like through the low pass filter. So let's think about the high pass filter. So I'm just going to I'm going to leave this plot here and I'm going to label this as V out low. And then we will also do V out high. So let's draw our high pass filter. So, our high pass filter, we have Vn between these two guys. And now for the high pass filter, boom, boom, we put our capacitor there. We put our resistor here. And here is the V out. There's something I should mention. For these filters to work exactly as advertised, no current can go through here. So if it's a voltmeter, that's great. And in fact, the uh, computer that we're using will basically take no current. If current does go through here, that means that the current isn't all going through the resistor. The analysis that we did, assuming all the current was just here, was slightly wrong. There's some resistance, maybe some capacitance over here. If there's other stuff, and that'll change the time constant of the whole thing. So, oh, as long as, so then that's why, this is ultimately why, um, when you look at sound, if you've ever hooked up sound devices, you have to think about impedance, and impedance is an AC thing related to resistance. That's why you have to have impedance match stuff and stuff so that things work out well. So what we're going to do is just assume that this V out we're measuring with a voltmeter or something like that that draws basically no current so that all these analyses are fine. So let's do the high pass current thing. Well, first of all, this is just like what if in the previous thing with the low pass filter I had measured the voltage across the resistor. And you know that the voltage across the capacitor 
plus the voltage across the resistor has to equal Vn, right? Just go around this loop, plus Vn, minus Vc, minus Vr, boom, has to be zero, right? So I could actually look at this and say that this minus this is what I should get for um, the voltage across the resistor. Say, well, okay, interesting. So let's, uh, we can do that, but let's think about another thing here. It's also got the time constant. Let's just think about, again, as the capacitor starts uncharged, when you first turn this thing on, there's a big voltage here. The capacitor is uncharged, so there should actually be a pretty big current when things start. So, um, in fact, it should exactly, the voltage across the resistor is just this. There's a big current, and the voltage across the resistor is just Vn. Hey, that's interesting. But as time goes by, the capacitor charges up. And once the capacitor is charged all the way, which you know it never really is, but it approaches that, Vn, you should see um, plus Vn minus Vc. Well, if Vc is Vn, plus Vn minus Vn. Oh, there's no voltage drop left across the resistor, so no current is flowing at this point, so there's no voltage drop. So it should just go to zero. And so what you actually expect is this starts high, and then it goes to zero. And yeah, that's just like this. It's like one minus of that. So that keeps going here. But now what happens when the capacitor has this voltage, but the other guy, uh, sorry, the capacitor has this voltage, but now the power supply has negative the same voltage. Well, now that's a minus Vn minus another Vn. It's like, oh my goodness, there's a huge negative voltage. We ought to get a pretty huge negative voltage across the resistor. And in fact, the voltage across the resistor will jump down to here, right, where this is minus 2 V0. Call this V0, minus V0, and that's minus 2 V0. We'll have 2 V0 up here. I didn't quite draw it far enough away, but I ran out of board space. Right, and so that's what the voltage of the resistor has to jump to right here, so that resistor voltage plus um, capacitor voltage, so the red is the capacitor plus the resistor, so 1 plus negative 2 equals negative 1 to get that. But then eventually, when these two are the same, this thing should fall back to that. And so you'll get that. And then what goes to this is just the inverse of that. This should jump up to this and fall back, and jump up and fall back. Right, so that's what's going to happen if you look at this through a high-pass filter. So let's just think about this for a moment. Remember, think in terms of sine waves. When this thing is flat, it's like no sine wave. Boom, it's, low, it's as low frequency as you can get. So the low pass filter just sends it through. Um, the high pass filter just filters it completely out, right? Because it's the lowest frequency you get and nothing goes through the high pass filter. When you go from here to here, that's an extremely fast change, right? Boom, boom, sudden change. A sudden change is a very fast change. That's like a very high frequency. So all of a sudden, there should be a lot going through the high pass and um, the low pass filter should not be, well, it still passes the fact that this was high. But the low pass filter should not be able to keep up with this high change. But the high pass filter should all of a sudden say, oh my goodness, there's a big negative change happening really fast. The high pass filter should suddenly pass a signal that's big that then decays away once you get further away from this. So boom, boom. So that's what you're seeing here is the high pass filter. Every time there's a big change, boom, the high pass filter says, oh, stuff is happening really fast, I better pass something like this. And so the, this orange here is the V out from the high pass filter. So again, we will look at this in lab next week and make sure that it really behaves this way. But that's what we predict. So hold on to this thought. We will predict this. We will go ahead and put it in lab and see, is this the behavior we actually get with a real low pass and real high pass filter when we send a squared wave into it? Those are all the problems for this week.